Now CHIRPS here, this is another uh, satellite data set if you're looking at the precipitation index, you see a lot more red. See the coloration has a lot to do with your feeling of the drought. So why is it so red in comparison to what the USDA was putting out? This is for a European audience here. I'll jump back. You see the coloration difference. Which one's scarier? Which ones are they going to run with? Do you think? Welcome back to Bright on TV. David Dubine here. Adapt 2030, many Ice Age conversations. We, just before the break, we're talking about the drought cycle in China. Let's switch right over to the U.S. because it seems that we're in the once in a 1200 year drought and the news says that it's all our fault. Now take that into context for just a second here. Once in a 1,200 year period, drought means that 1,200 years ago, it was exactly the same drought condition. What happened to us affecting anything climate-wise 1,200 years ago? So to even have the measurements, obviously they did some really good research to find drought cycles either through uh, looking at tree ring data after the floods that had deposited things, then there was no rainfall after that. But going back 1,200 years and we're back to the same point again means it happened prior and we're back to the exact same starting point, but nobody wants to even touch that with a 10-foot pole. I wonder why nobody ever asked those easy, simple questions. And you watch, uh, they'll, they'll deflect away from any sort of answer, especially if you get into the debate. That's why I try to give charts here so you can use those, screen grab those, take them, and then present the information as a data point with true science behind it because this is all peer-reviewed research that I'm presenting. Anybody can look at this. So let's start here with uh, Earth Science Review. This one's been making the rounds of California media about the 200-year drought. But you notice how it's gone from a 200-year drought into a 1,200-year drought to try to get the severity uh, in your mind. It says, well, it's all our fault. It's so dry. You know, Lake Mead's dried up a little bit. But you have to realize that those weren't even lakes a few hundred years ago. Those were dams creating the lakes. So to even come at it from that perspective of saying, oh, the lake's going to dry up, it was a river before that they dammed up. Now the thing again, the 1865 drought that was referenced for the cotton production losses, we can find right here in California. At 1850 on the slide, it says California becomes a state. Slide that over a sliver and you're into the 1865 era. Right there at the tiniest little rise in the drought cycle, what overlaps with, again, California, uh, cotton growing regions in, from Texas over in the southeast U.S., maps up with the drought, and then also in China matches those same exact dates. It was a global event and a continental-wide event on each continent across the globe. But if we look further back in history, around, let's say, 1150 AD, that was a mega drought, seriously dry. And it looks like it was a very dry period from, say, 900 AD up through 1300 AD. Again, orders of magnitude above what is claimed as the mass, most massive drought of ever proportions today. Literally, orders of magnitude above that. Steve Forbes warns a big financial crisis incoming. Meanwhile, the Fed raised rates again with the single biggest rate hike in four decades. Economists are forecasting that the Fed will panic and pivot, and they're going to start cutting rates again in 2023. Gold's going to soar. That's why Wells Fargo, Bloomberg, Goldman Sachs all forecast gold well above 2,000 an ounce. Ask yourself, do you really think big government's going to stop spending and the Fed's going to stop printing money? Call the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. Mention the Adapt 2030 channel when you call. They're going to give you some great service. Patriot Gold Group has a no-fee-for-life IRA where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold or silver, and you may qualify for the No Fee for Life IRA on qualifying rollovers. Give them a call, 888-546-7020 to get your free investor guide today. And with the knowledge that Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs top rated IRA gold dealer for six years in a row, it'd be good to talk to them, 888 
546-7020. And now on with the video. Easy charts to find. Again, long-term aridity changes in the western United States means long-term drying patterns in the western U.S. Those same red arrows of the mega droughts line up with that previous chart right here. So you can look at the data in a, a different set of fashions and different researchers coming with the same conclusions. Yes, there were dry periods. It's a cycle. There's always dry periods. But they can be mapped out in clusters. And the clusters of severity compared to today are, well, it's minor today. Climate. We keep hearing about the heat wave, the heat wave, the heat wave everywhere. This is from our own government, U.S., doing the heat wave index, the U.S. annual heat wave index. So from the 1930s, the Dust Bowl era, was it warmer? I mean, look how many spikes there were orders of magnitude above. Again, that's like a 7x increase compared to today's temperatures. Now somebody will come out and say, well, you don't have 2022 all the way to August on this thing. Well, you know, there's a delay in data being released from the gov. I don't understand, you know, with, with all these computers and all these minute up-to-the-minute details that prove that we got runaway global warming, but it takes them, you know, six months to release data. So they can prove to you in a millisecond that they have a, a snap, something that went above the, the temperature range, but then it takes six months to actually map it out for you. And then they adjust it along the way, too. So the heat wave index, I encourage you to look at this. Uh, you can go back. This is a very common chart. Uh, NOAA would provide you with this one, National Atmospheric Oceanic Administration, NOAA. That's where this one comes from. And again, it was 1895, so it didn't really go back into the 1865 era, but there's other anecdotal de evidence that does. So if it's a continental global thing, we should also look at Europe and see if there's any overlapping time frames to see was there extreme drought that overlapped on these times and it was not a once in a, we caused it period. So as I showed you in China, I should say more Asia in general, from India over to Southeast Asia and then up into China, that whole drought cycle from the 1600s. Well, this is another one that I like the way they map it because they're similar mapping. 1616. 1921 seemed to be the largest drought pattern in the last 400 years here in Europe. So to go back to 1921 and say, oh, humans caused the, the runaway heat pattern in either 1893 is another really good match up to what we're seeing today. And 1921 blows away anything that we're seeing today. Anything is re remotely. 1921 was a disaster. And then we can go further back in time. 1616 is a good one as well. But what was causing these prior to what we're being told as the cause of all the change of anything climate related? That should be another question that needs to be asked when you look at previous climate data. So I drew these off of the USDA and then Copernicus satellite data sets looking at France. This is the drought, they call it. Oh, a terrifying picture. A terrifying picture would have been a 1921 overlook of the same exact area that would have been far browner than that. So the European crops, the way they're looking at the moisture deficit in the soil or, or moisture abundance would be more green. Uh, this is the map they're showing currently, the deviation from normal. Now if it was a 1921 map, that would be scarlet red across the entire map. But what we're looking at today, yes, is significant declines in rainfall affecting crops. 15% minimum on the record, at least coming out as of this week in, in Europe. But when you take these two into consideration, and then if you overlap it on history, it seems like the media is running with the narrative. Again, they're playing the drought card because the temperatures aren't rising any longer. They're actually going to start declining as we head into this grand solar minimum, and we get this volcanic feedback loop in the southern hemisphere, which will skew the temperature, skew the temperatures much cooler on a global basis. And I'm going to make all here. They're going to start splitting the hemispheres apart because they can't run with the same narrative any longer. I'm not sure how it's going to be done, but in the future, global temperatures will be skewed into, it's a southern hemisphere thing. It's not, well, it's a global, and they're going to try to mishmash it this way. Watch it, because now the cooling has started in the southern hemisphere. It's going to run for two more years. And the explanations will need to be forthcoming. Now, CHIRPS here, this is another uh, satellite data set if you're looking at the precipitation index. You see a lot more red. See, the coloration has a lot to do with your feeling of the drought. So why is it so red in comparison to what the USDA was putting out? This is for a European audience here. I'll jump back. You see the coloration difference. 
Which one's scarier? Which ones are they going to run with, do you think? So we'll see the same areas and the same patterns. Uh, Central Hungary, Northern France, Germany. I talked to a person I know over in Denmark said they're having decent crop production there and also in Switzerland. But those are small in comparison to German production and French total production. So the World Agricultural Production Report, obviously I pull these. I like to look at them. Uh, this comes off Ag Facts. And they're showing August 17th, what, a few days back. European metric tonnage in terms of food output currently is 15% below last year's crop level, which was down 10% from the previous year. So if you take it into context, they're down 25% from two years ago. And then talking with a couple persons I know on the Chicago Board of Trade, up in, Ch in Chicago, obviously, at the CBOT or the CME, they're saying, at least the, the picture they painted for me was, warehouses are now stocking the best they can grain production knowing that in the future it's going to rise. So not all this production that was slated to go out into the export market will make it there. People are becoming greedier and they know if they hold it they can rise the price, raise it up, bid the price and somebody's going to buy it. 50% over the market rate, two times bid, perfect, I'll take it. So the, the grain storage facilities are going to be chock-a-block, full as can be, but there'll still be shortages and price rises on the, on the foodstuffs out there. Because somebody eventually will come and pay more money for it, whether it be an African nation, a developing nation, a nation that greatly relies on food imports. They're going to outbid each other, and somebody will be there with the stored grains that's not in the European market that should drive prices down, waiting for an external buyer to come in to pay a much higher price. So now we're getting into the scalping artificial shortage game here, in addition to the natural crop losses that we're seeing. Now, significant changes are inbound for the end of the year here. And to put this into a context, France had a rule, a law, that if you, you had to let your fields go fallow for a season before you could replant. Now they're doing away with that rule because they need the fields in production 24-7 forever now because they just know they won't have enough food. So when you see countries that are taking away their own green agenda principles because they can't feed themselves, you know there's a problem. This was instituted because of the green agenda to try to reduce fertilizer, but this is many years ago. And now they're going to rescind that because they need food. People are getting hungry, let them eat cake. France understands the longer history. And speaking of that, let's talk about drought stones for a second. We keep hearing about these drought stones popping up and they, they signal one. Traditionally, this is before all the dams and dikes and levees and uh, canals and waterways were really worked on by mankind in the last hundred years. They would have rivers that would flow by and when it reached a certain low point they called it a drought stone or a famine stone. And when it got incredibly low they would put a mark there and write, and there's a famous one that says, when you see me cry, and that was on the Elbe River coming down from Prague out of the Czech Republic into Germany. The water levels at that point there was no backup. Think about 1600 the waterworks projects. Minimal. Today we can store water at a much more efficient rate in dams, etc. But these drought stones were used and referenced through antiquity of low water levels meant famines. Famines, angry people changed government. So governments were terrified when they saw a famine stone or a drought stone come up again because they knew, oh, society is going to get a little unstable here. So these are some good... Uh, Reference points, 1616, 1746, and you'll see the different droughts that were on the stones. And these are from a bevy of rivers across Europe. So what I wanted to do was try to match this up with the known points of drought stones on maps here. And this is what this is. Anywhere you see a, a red dot is called a hunger stone or a drought stone. And I like to map it up with today's rivers also to see the exact same drought stones and what the water levels are now compared to drought levels to see if we can get some correlation in history. So I'm going to, it even is boxed there right near Dresden. And you'll see there's a huge amount of drought stones through the Elbe River there. Dresden, yes, that is the same city that was firebombed by the U.S. to demoralize Germany. That Dresden is the same Dresden referenced on the map. But the low stage watermarks from these hunger stones going back 1616, now, here, you've got to keep this in mind, the centimeter height of how deep. So, for us in the States, 30 centimeters is a foot. 
And they reference here on the left side what the centimeter heights are. So 15, 17, massive drought, it only got to about 120 centimeters. And if you go down through time and you start to look through, 1536 got to about 140 centimeters. And then you come to the next super major drought, and it was around 140 centimeters. Some are even higher at 150 centimeters, and they had a quote-unquote drought. But you'll see 1706, massive drought, 130 centimeters. Again, around 135 is the rate that you look for massive societal change. And if it were indeed that deep of a drought right now, we should see the same water levels. So I decided to go over to the German water monitoring stations here and just pick out. They're all green, which means they're navigable. And the water height right there is 145 centimeters. So you tell me who's pushing the narrative on the drought card right now to get you scared to push global agendas. We can go back as far as you want in history and do this all day long. And here you go. I even went up into the Czech Republic uh, water because they have, you know, further up the tributary, up into Praha or Prague, they also have a section of Elbe River that they monitor. Right here, 145 centimeters. Now it is forecast to drop to 140, but it's still in that same range of we've seen other droughts that were far worse than that. Also, the thing that's an outlier off the charts that goes past the 1600s, which is really, the further you go back in history, the less information there is. But the mega drought in 1450, this would be a society ending event here. The amount of water is so low compared to anything else in the last, say, 600 years, it is startling how low that went. Everything would have died. There would have been mass famine. Oh, there was. Oh, another plague came back. Yeah, well, malnourished bodies are going to get sick more easily, which when we come up and we start to get bad and worse food choices, you're going to have to supplement your health with trying to keep your body really healthy because through history, the reason famines sweep through land so quickly and armies overrun populations so quickly, they're malnourished. They're not making good decisions. Their brains aren't functioning correctly. So as you move forward, read through history on people on how they alleviated these negative effects of not having enough calories in the body and how the cognitive function of adding more fat into your diet, positive fats, will help you think faster and better, which will be your key to survival as we move forward. Because you can see that this global agenda from the World Economic Forum is absolutely trying to limit food, production, and consumption. They want you to eat bugs. Well, no, I'd rather eat some drought-stressed corn with a lower protein content than eat a cricket. Thank you. I'll still eat the, the subpar protein content than I would ever want to eat crickets. England, you're going to start to hear about this in the news. They came out publicly and said they were going to lose 50, 50% of their crop production this year due to droughts. And now they're going to start restricting water usage across, well, everywhere. Now, I didn't do that much research on England because we can only squeeze so much into an hour. But I encourage you to. Uh, there's an enormous amount of water rationing stories coming out about England. And this will be the new hot push button. Watch it in the next week. This is going to flare off. It's going to be a super flare in the sky. England, England, drought, drought. Watch this. They're going to run with it. They're going to say it's the, the biggest drought ever in England. But I assure you there were droughts that were far worse than this one. And if you complain about this, if you complain because your lifestyle is being degraded and absolutely crushed on purpose and you're being starved out, uh, unemployed out, small business taxed out, and you complain about that, you are labeled as an enemy of the state in Germany. This is the way they're going to move forward with it, and they're going to try to out-tax you out of your land, too. They're going to tax you so much that you're not going to be able to afford your land. But we'll start right here. Germany's sanctions on Russia are self-sanctioning, and their industries are reverberating in a negative way because of this. They're shutting down their power plants, not only because there's not enough water to run, but also anything coal, verboten. And then we start to see that if you complain about putting solar panels or having to move to unreliable wind, if your food prices rise too much and you can't heat your homes in the middle of winter because they've told all the landlords to turn the heating down to 10 degrees or 12 degrees Celsius, you don't have a job, and you complain about that, you are now labeled as an enemy of the state in Germany because you're complaining about your life condition being forced upon you with these World Economic Forum reset policies. And this net zero goal in 2050 to 
Take away liquid fuels, liquid fuels, and replace it with that monstrosity of these solar panels, which we don't have enough rare earth minerals and supply chain to even push all this into place in the first place. Yet by complaining about it, you are labeled an enemy of the state and be taken away at night by the secret police is what he is saying that needs to happen. And brush stroking everybody who complains about lifestyle degradation as an enemy of the state. They're going to copy paste this across the planet. This is another thing that you can see where the end goal is. So you know that this is going to be used in tandem. All countries follow the same model now. There's no more independent nations. They're all operating as a global governance structure. Now we're starting to see it with the response with net zero and carbon emissions and targets. And I encourage you to read about the 1400s and what serfdom was like. The limited choices. That's where they want to take it back again. That's why I say it's a, you know, whether it be a drought cycle or a, you know, a 400 year or 2000 year solar cycle, it seems that there's a, a civilization reset cycle built into this as well. And I want to come back to the net zero again because where we have sat in 2019 and how our lifestyles and, you know, think about how different our world is now, that dotted line is 2019. We've only marched a couple of years into the decline in the use of fossil fuels and the conversion to wind and solar. That's a huge steep drop. We need to go continuously from there. That means almost nobody will have power in your home at 2050. Now, if we use electrogravitics and Tesla technologies that use Earth's magnetic field, that's a different way to think. On-demand hydrogen is another one. There's no way we're going to be able to put enough tanks and pipelines and all this for hydrogen. And it's going to be on-demand only. But even this transition period is, is going to be tumultuous at best, even taking us out to 2025. And one last thing here, I do appreciate you watching and spending your time with, now that we have more information, we can, you know, every time you see the news article about drought, say, whoa, 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 you're playing the drought card. I want to take you back in history again. We always keep hearing about it's the fastest temperature rise ever. Well, there's a period called the Younger Dryas Era. Cometary impact on the ice sheet, northern Canada, cooled global temperatures, dropped us back from the emerging ice age back into an ice age. But if you look right around, say, 11,000 years prior, we rose 10 degrees Celsius in a matter of a decade and a half. They forget this chart here. That's why they always stop their charting at 9,000 years prior. They don't want you to see this little secret bit over here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week. Bye for now. David Dubine signing off.